The dominant theme of Jacques Rancière's work is his account of how new political and social identities can arise, and how the voices of once oppressed and excluded groups can come to be heard and recognised by the dominant social order. During the 20th century, the process of new identities and subjectivities, who can now have genuine political presence, began to emerge. The LGBT, civil rights and disability rights movements became far more prominent. For Rancière, this movement and development arises specifically through acts of perception and the birth of new identities. Rancière does not see this occurring through traditional political structures like party politics or government legislation, but through discrete transformative episodes of perception and experience, and importantly, through art. Le partage du sensible is certainly the most significant concept within Rancière's work, but it cannot be located simply as a tool to analyse the diverse worlds of politics, philosophy, art, aesthetics and film. Rather, it is his very engagement with this concept, this distribution of the sensible, that unites these fields. As David Panagia and Joseph Tanke both established in their own introductions to Rancière, without an understanding of this partage, it would be impossible to gain a foothold in Rancière's framework. Thus, it's pretty evident that this must be the starting point in trying to grapple with Rancière's often unclear work. Very briefly, the distribution of the sensible refers to how the dominant social order in society determines which individuals, groups and identities will be recognised as having some form of political importance and having voices that are worth listening to. Imagine walking into a busy street in London, your immediate and intuitive perception of a hierarchy of identities, black, gay, white, disabled, rich and poor, and how the relations between these people work are all determined by the distributions of the sensible. However, I think it's first important to give a timeline of Rancière's ideas and how the distribution of the sensible actually came to take shape. I placed a pretty scathing quote from a young, mischievous-looking Rancière from his quite recently translated work, Althusser's Lesson, next to a disgruntled-looking Louis Althusser. The quote summarises the important rupture that initiated Rancière's own career. Louis Althusser was the father of a branch of new political ideology called Structuralist Marxism, a branch of Marxist theory that arose in the mid-20th century. He attempted to re-establish Marxism as a firmly scientific doctrine, bound to discovering objective relations in reality, and thus his model of how future revolutions and changes in society might occur, and the nature of the proletariat working classes that might initiate such revolutions, came into conflict with the more humanistic and spontaneous elements of revolutionary movements that were developing in the 1960s. Althusser ultimately would not recognise the calls for change and action from a vocal society of workers and students, as they were not led by a true revolutionary party and did not fit his theories of revolution. And it is this dismissive attitude towards the new political developments in society and the creation of new radical identities that Rancière came to reject. It's seemingly impossible to encounter Rancière as a thinker without at least a brief introduction to his participation in Althusser's seminar-based book Reading Capital, a study of Karl Marx's huge tome on political economy, Das Kapital. Supposedly, Althusser had yet to, and almost understandably considering its length, either complete capital by the time of the writing of his book. Yet it was a crucial text for French political theory of the late 1960s, and importantly for Rancière, who was excluded from many future editions, it was the high point of his relation to Marx's academia before a powerful break from this tradition. His new approach arose as a reflection on Althusser's own writings following the May 1968 student uprisings. Throughout Europe in 1968, and in its epicentre in Paris, huge civil unrest began to unfold as the mass protests of students aligned with the massive general strikes of the workers in the country. The economy came to a standstill, the political establishment was in turmoil and terror, and the social consciousness of France was further altered. However, Althusser, like many figures in the Communist Party of France, condemned the student uprisings, which were anarchistic in nature and certainly inspired by the anti-scientific, avant-garde theories of the group, the Situationists. They felt they were simply the chaotic indulgent acts of petty bourgeois students and could not constitute a real political revolution. Rancière, seeming like every French academic who would come to dominate continental theory over the next few decades, was deeply affected by these events. He came to realise that the theories of his previous teacher simply form new hierarchies between the knowing, intelligent academic and the unknowing, voiceless working class who were simply the forces of history, the motors of change, which had no real subjectivity. To propose that the theoretical coherence and dogmatic bondage to the writings of a mature Karl Marx were necessary for revolution was absurd and elitist, felt Rancière. And although the concept of the distribution of the sensible really took shape as a concept over the next few decades, it was his animosity towards Althusser that really gave birth to it. Rancière's view that the fundamental feature of domination is the refusal to see, hear and sense the voices of apprentice groups forms completely from his rejection of Althusser's philosophy. Moving on from that brief outline of the intellectual roots of the concept, which I do think are crucial to really grasping the significance of the idea and how it was born from Rancière's estrangement from the orthodox party Marxism of his younger years, 
we must now first explore the meaning of the term partage. Although my French is limited to faux aphorisms, wiser sources inform me that partage holds a classic double meaning. So like Derrida's difference, both must be accounted for. First, it refers to an act of distribution and sharing. In reference to what is sensible, it implies what a particular community of people can see, hear, know and speak of, which identities they can recognise and those who they deem worthy of listening to. Secondly, it thus also means the divisions, structures and separations in this community, determining who has claimed to what. So as Joseph Tanke usefully explains, the departage parcels up space and time in society to split it up and divide it, but also to share it and distribute it amongst the people. It thus implicitly determines what constitutes the people, and the body or social convention who determines this distribution. To put it in Rancière's own confusing words, the partage du sensible is a system of self-evident facts of sense perception that simultaneously discloses the existence of something in common and the delimitations that define the respective parts and positions within it. This seems like a rather abstract and strange idea, and odd that Rancière puts it at the crux of his outlook, but hopefully through some references to aesthetics and politics, I can explain what he means when he awkwardly claims this. Here are two examples which outline what the distribution of the sensible precisely means, through showing how it can be altered and changed. Much of Rancière's work is specifically to do with aesthetics and the discussions of art theory. And although this seems totally distinct from emancipatory politics, Rancière reveals the fundamental similarity between them. Tony Ross, in her essay, Image and Montage, explains clearly how the distribution of the sensible works within art. I place Edward Manet's famous painting, A Bar at the Foie de Baguette, his last major work, painted in 1882, on this slide. The painting is already well known for how it plays with the vision and perception, like how the image on the mirror is clearly different from the first-person perspective and the mismatches of the bottles shown on the bar front and those in the mirror. But it is also important in terms of the distribution of the sensible. It includes a complete, vivid and focused account of a simple girl working behind the bar, not engaged in the bourgeois indulgences of the guests around her, simply frozen in a moment of work and labour. Manet's work introduces figures usually resigned to the background, and brings them to the forefront of the scene. Of course, he also painted elite society and their lunchtime follies, but alongside painters like Gustave Courbet, he enabled urban life to take centre stage, and without distaste or pity, but true representation. The things which can be sensed through vision and representation, the sensible, have changed and developed. They have a new distribution. Gustave Courbet's works presents a similar development in what might be seen and visualised within high art, as he gave focus and passion towards gentle everyday scenes. He rejected the tradition of academic painting within France, and he did not simply fetishise the struggles or glorify the simplicity of the common man with elitist assumptions, but Courbet engaged and represented the masses with all their flaws, habits and practices. In terms of art and media, Rancia outlines this change in the distribution of the sensible, in which people that we rarely see come to take centre stage, as constituting the aesthetic regime of art. However, I'll cover this in a later video. But how does this actually associate with politics? Well, it's first important to understand Rancière's own conception of what actually meets the criteria for being political. And as he says politics is something that occurs very rarely, this isn't much. Again, I plan to cover this in another video. But briefly, politics is the meeting of a subject or group with the distribution of the sensible, which cannot account for their existence. They break down the shares and divisions within the social orderings of beings. Again, what does this mean? Todd May, in his introduction and exploration of Rancière's theory, gives an example of the student sit-in demonstrations in 1960s America. Although he uses this specifically as an example of understanding Rancière's concept of the police, it works well in understanding the political dimension of the partage. Imagine yourself as a white figure in Southern America, on break from work and entering into a local Woolworth store for a lunch service, to encounter three black bodies at the lunch counter. It's lunchtime and they are trying to be served. They are right up front, on the seats you sit on every day, engaging with the store workers that serve you your food and listen to your demands. They have ruptured and altered the expectations of what you might see, how you might hear their, their speech for service and food, and arise as figures who are previously ignored within this particular context. They fit into your perception in a way you cannot quite understand. The distribution of the sensible has met with it a census, showing that your classification of space and time no longer applies effectively. Therefore, as I explained earlier, the dominant ideology, which can be seen as the social body which controls the distribution of racism, segregation and superiority that was present in 1960s America, has been challenged and undermined through a visual experience, an act of perception. The old distribution of what might be seen and heard now has to take into account new identities, like the appearance of working class people in early modern art, having a political dimension, the sense experience of young black students in white spaces has an aesthetic and artistic dimension for the human act of perception. I think it's therefore clear that aesthetics and politics are deeply bound to one another through their relation to the distribution of the sensible. 
The most radical conclusion from Rancia's work is that all art is political. Although he himself rarely makes anything like such explicit, normative statements, the distribution of the sensible reveals that no art can escape its condition and relation to the dominant ordering of perception within society. However, that is not to say that all art must suddenly become worker-oriented, socialist realism, or subversive situationist detournement for it to be cleared by the Rancierian clique to not be reactionary, simply that all art holds some kind of political dimension. Furthermore, politics can never escape an aesthetic and perceptual understanding, because it was always engaged with seeing, hearing and recognising different subjects, identities and potentials. Finally, I think it is important to understand this concept in relation to the theories and frameworks of other thinkers. I think the most obvious comparison would be to Foucault's concept of discourse. Foucault was similarly interested in what counts as knowledge throughout time, and how societies can determine who has the ability to hold knowledge and power. And he thus shares with Rancière an interest in how hierarchies between the knowing and unknowing can develop. More distantly, there may be some comparison possible with Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist theoretician, and his idea of common sense versus good sense. Gramsci felt that the hegemonic political order in society established what counts as common sense and as intuitive to ensure that no dissent from its power would occur. And this perhaps mirrors Rancière's idea of how the dominant order in society could shape the distribution of the sensible. The distribution of the sensible really is the centre of all of Rancière's work, and he himself writes in his 1992 work The Philosopher and His Poor that the dividing line between the knowing and the unknowing has been the constant focus of his attention. Remember, critical art is art that aims to produce a new perception of the world, and therefore to create a commitment to its transformation.